Buju, I'm Rita Karpinen, your host for PBS North's Native Report. Miigwech for joining us for the final episode of the 19th season. Production for Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation. The generous support from viewers like Jack and Sharon Kemp and viewers like you. Today's episode will be a little different than usual. We are breaking format to explore a highly controversial topic, American Indian boarding schools, also known as residential schools. These schools were established in the mid 17th century with the main goal of assimilating Native American children. They stole children from their families, took their names, their language, cut their hair and erased their history. Tonight we will discuss how the erasure of history has led to intergenerational trauma we will look at how some indigenous people have processed that trauma while bringing awareness to it. The historical trauma that I am most familiar with and most um, connected to, I guess, would be the Indian boarding school experience. And my grandparents actually met at a boarding school in northern Minnesota. They were of a, a generation that really, as, as my uncle used to tell me, had no choice. And the government um, really got into the boarding school business after the Civil War. There had been boarding schools before that, but large amounts of federal money going into the system is what really made it happen nationwide. Assimilation as, um, as kind of the foundation for the boarding school system was actually something that was considered quite progressive for its time after the Civil War when um, a former Army officer, um, Colonel Pratt, actually thought that in working with American Indian prisoners, he felt that they could learn to read and write, they could learn to assimilate, to fold themselves into larger society. And so instead of actually physically um, decimating Indian populations, um, this was supposed to be a, a nicer way of dealing with things. It did take a lot of money to build a boarding school system in America, and they did it actually fairly quickly. Certainly, he could not have done this without the tremendous support and lobbying of other people and other organizations in this country. It was um, churches and suffragist movements, literacy groups, women's temperance groups. They were um, There were many people who were um, who were supporting this. And so the removal of children from their homes and the, um, the placement of them in a school far enough away that they wouldn't be able to get home to visit and their parents wouldn't be able to see them very often was part of the purpose of the Indian boarding school system. As part of assimilation into larger American society, they were not allowed to speak their own native language. They were um, not allowed to wear their clothes or their hair in the way that they had. They had to be changed physically into, um, into something that would be an imitation of larger, more dominant society in America. The curriculum was not the same as in regular public schools, and the children were not well-educated. Assimilation was the 
was the the first of like a three prong approach. And so the second um, and in order of importance in curriculum too, would have been preparation for a job or a profession or um, what their lives would be once they finished school, if they finished school, which many did not. And so reading, writing, academic things then was third in priority. And so the education um, most children received was, it was not only um, different from regular education, but it was, it was inferior. It was necessary to try to undo everything, to remove everything that was, that was Native, that was Indian about the children, and then replace that with something else. Well, some experiences were very, very bad. Not everything was bad all the time, as my relatives told me. But at the same time, that, um, that rupture of, of family and community um, created, created real challenges as far as being able to pass the time-honored ways of, of, of knowing the world, of, of teaching and learning, of Native worldviews and tribal beliefs and practices. If they returned home and if they survived, they had been brought up without the, the ways of passing knowledge down that generations before them had had. It, it was not only that the children who had been at boarding school were returning to some type of vacuum. They were bringing their own problems that had developed while they were at school with them. And so there were many social problems that they were, they were going to have to try to live with and deal with. And then, you know, perhaps raise their own children who at really um, critical points in their life might be removed from home too. And that is what happened with my family for a couple of generations. As my uncle wanted so much for me to, to know that it was not his mother's choice, that people had no choice. Something that is at the foundation of intergenerational trauma for the boarding school families is that there is a, there's a long road back. And I don't know if we, I don't know if we ever actually will get all the way back, you know, to, to the strength of the families that was there before. We certainly recognize this and we want this and we work on it, but how do you do this without the, the tools that are necessary to do so? My name is uh, Keith Sokola and uh, my middle name is Malvin. And one of my given Indian names is Masabi Wainini, which means Masabi is the Iron Range of Minnesota or a, a spiritual name. I call myself a musician, but it's much um, more than that. You know, a producer, a uh, engineer, a recorder, a songwriter. In fact, I think songwriter is maybe the most comfortable and historical trauma is something that is intergenerational and passed down. When we're talking about the boarding schools and things and parochial schools and things, the loss of language, the loss of self-esteem, you know, it's very well documented. The fear and anxiety that is created when people go through something traumatic, emotional fear of everything from abandonment to um, they could go through physical pain and th physical abuse, which is usually the case. So you name things, you name them with descriptions. And I think historical trauma can be categorized like that. You can almost label them like this was because of this, this happened to this. And it could be everything from physical abuse to mental. And and this pain is passed down through generations, through people, and I even think even interspecies sometimes, you know, like animal spirits and things like that. They, they can create um, just the chaos that they've existed. You experience it as a child, as you see your older relatives struggle with things that has been in their past. And you kind of pass this down you know, to your kids too. I had an uncle, a friend, when I say uncle in the native way, when he was a little boy, he would wet his bed at night. And in the daytime when they have a lineup, the residential person would make him 
put his pissy blankets around him so that everybody could make fun of him, you know? And so he plays guitar to this day and he's older than me. And I think that's how people heal. One of the, in the parochial experiences that the pastor or the priest would scare him with a snake, a big yellow snake, a boa snake. And then they'd abuse him and, and scare him and would let the snake go out in the halls that night too physical things like that you know like how do you heal from something like that you know like when you hear things like that did this really happen to our ancestors they're our ancestors and they're younger than us when they had these experiences there is a lot of ramifications from them and there are a lot of reasons probably the ultimate one was the the whole historical greed and the taking of land and languages and things like that um you know, take everything from the native people, take the children, the most precious gift of all. I think that was the, the intention of a, a cultural genocide. But I see the healing, it comes from the expressions of love, of the quantum dreams that we can hear from them children who experience that fear and that pain and that anxiety. Late at night, they'd probably go out in the schoolyard and pray. And I think them prayers went up into the stars and now they're coming down on us and they're helping us heal by having us create art, create songs. In Anishinaabe culture, we have these things called dream catchers. We put them over our baby's cradles and there's a little hole in the middle. And the hole is for the good dreams that come through and enter a baby's mind. And then the, the bad dreams get caught up in the webs and I think that uh, as a songwriter, we have song catchers over us too, you know, and they catch songs, they come through. And that's what I think, you know, that that's how I think the song came. Native people call the um, North America, Turtle Island. We believe that North America is created on the shell of a turtle. I was up in the, the most central location of North America of Turtle Island, and that's Winnipeg. If you looked at the, the city of Winnipeg, it's right in the middle of Turtle Island. I was playing a concert up there, and I, I always get up, I like getting up early and having coffee and writing and maybe taking a walk or something. And one morning after my show, I did. And I seen a lot, a lot, a lot of people were lined up like for, t to go into this building. And I noticed there were native people there, you know, like, oh, those are, those are all look like native people. And so I went up to someone and I asked in the, in the crowd, I go, what's going on? Here? Um, and this woman says, oh yeah, um, they're having a reconciliation testimonies. At that time, the premier of Canada was Stephen Harper. And he had these testimonials all over across Canada where victims, that were victimized by the boarding schools or parochial schools up there in Canada um, could come and testify of the, the perpetrator, what happened to him. And the, the only thing they couldn't say was the name. They couldn't say who did it or, you know, they could tell the story. And I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy. And inside, it was like a big room like this and kind of dark and one person would come up and share. And I thought a long time, should I go in there? You know, and I don't know, it's, I don't want to feel that sadness like I didn't. But then the other part of me thought about, you know, I'm a songwriter and I record my people, happiness and grief. And so I went in there and from the very first words that this woman uttered, she says, it happened late at night. The priest would come down the hall. And then the irony of it was 25 years later, the same priest who perpetrated her and married her and her husband. And just from that words like that, when she said it, you'd tingle. Not just she came up, one other person, another person, another person, another person. Later that morning, I remember walking around and 
I heard someone throwing up profusely, like, whoa. You know, thinking like, oh, somebody must have partied last night, you know. And it wasn't that at all. It was one of our healers from the Cree Nation, a, a medicine man, had one of the victims, and the victim was holding on to a tree, and he was helping the victim. And when they would do that, that victim would just throw up everything, like from the past. And so later that night, you know, I came home and uh, to my hotel room and I just started simple, you know. Almost like how the testimony started, you know. I think um, that one was like, it was very, very true, like late at night, down the hall, Monster scream, Roman crawl, and, and so like I'm, I'm spoofing on that, you know. Late at night, down the hall, monster scream, Roman crawl. Don't tell no one, or you'll get bad dreams. The actual words from the testimony, and those were the lyrics of that song, you know. Tears of our children take these tears. Tears come fall in 500 years. You know, tears come from 500 years. The prayers of our children take these tears. And, and so I, I like that, that last um, line, prayers of our children take these tears, because these children were our great grandparents and our grandparents and our grandmother and our grandfathers in our aunts and moms. Neil Young used to have a manager named uh, Elliot Robertson. He told me one time, he says, uh, important songwriters song write songs important to the people. And I think that's what you gotta do. You gotta write songs important to your people, your community. But that's where the inspiration came from, that long line of testimonies. We can, we can stop that inner intergenerational trauma by just healing, by laughing, by coming to grips with the emotional anxieties that were created by this, by writing art, by creating creativity in your own life. And I've seen this healing in British Columbia where elders will get up and start talking about it. A lot of tears and a lot of shame, but they're getting it out there and they're talking about it a little bit. And this is the beginning of healing, you know, to recognize them emotions, to start labeling them so that we're not overcome by them. I see uh, Native people uh, writing more, uh, playing music more, young people playing music more, old people too, and so. And then, then of course, the, the healthy ways to heal us, like right? we teach people to eat um, less processed foods and eat better, more natural foods. Same thing with music, you know, like we have to teach them to listen to natural music sometimes so that the only thing we hear is in these highly processed foods, like what we hear at the halftime at the um, Super Bowl is highly high sugar content, you know, like boom, it catches me, catches me, but you can't hear the wind and the healing of it. You know, or you can't hear a creak. We, we got to teach our young people that healing is here. It's not out there. But I think that's a response to how do people heal and how I've seen it through song, through physical education, through mental therapy. More people are seeking it out now, like it ain't a bad thing to talk about, you know, and, and we're all in this together. The Anishinaabe people, we talk about, um, you know, that, that love is the strongest medicine that all people have. We used to work together a long time ago up on the range. We both worked in Indian education. We wanted to do some good for the children um, from what we had seen. And so our, I guess our thoughts were on the kids, um, but on honoring the people who went to boarding schools ahead of us. You, you couldn't imagine if it happened to your children and, and for 
our grandparents and our parents to go through this and lose so much. And where are the remnants today, you know, like being a college student who's just learning the language, it's a, it's a little humbling, you know, even as an older man, it's a little humbling, but I'll take the humbleness because, and I'll take even the shame because of what our children and our grandparents went through. And this song, Say Your Name, is all about that. People of our generation are, we touch the children now, of course, but we, we touch the generation of boarding school children themselves. Um, it's a great honor, I think, to hear those stories and to, and to remember, remember them, remember their names. It's how we honor the past and the, and the future. You know, like there's a, a song that I play on my flute a lot, and it's called When the Buffalo Return His Children. And it's about this prophecy that the Lakota people have that the buffalo will return his children. And we see it in our lifetime. I, I, you know, in some form, if we know the immense slaughter of the buffalo and the correlation of our people too. But now we see these small herds coming, like a, a small kids playing and selling bracelets and, and uh, sweet things and laughing, you know, and being, being part of the healing, normalizing, normalizing being happy. You know, that would be, that would be something to see, wouldn't it? I, the normalizing of being happy. You know, we, we have been living, you know, in this shadow for some time, and I don't think we were meant to be living this, this way. I think we were meant for something, something much better, much nicer, um, and that our, our children will have that experience. And this thing is a long game for Native people. Mm -hmm. um, doing things today that will help the long game. We're not saying it's going to change overnight because we know better, but we play this long game for our children and our great grandchildren and things like that. Say your name Show your face Leave no trace Of the chain Tears come falling Five hundred years Prayers of our children Late at night Down the hall Monster scream Say your name Show your face Leave no trace All the games Tears stop falling Five hundred 
By the end of the 1970s, most of the Native American residential schools shut down. Although in 2016, the Bureau of Indian Education stated they continue to run 50 schools nationwide. No boarding schools remain open in Minnesota. If you'd like to learn more about Native American boarding schools, you can head over to nativereport.org. Thank you for spending time with your friends and neighbors from across Indian country. I'm Rita Karpinen. We'll see you next time on Native Report.